not that was like the wrong that. button, wasn't it? That was that the was wrong the button. Wrong, that was the wrong button. <laughs> to help, um, how do I share my screen? Oh, so see where it's got show and show screen, yeah. screen underneath. If you click on that little arrow, yep. it should come up with a selection. Okay. Oh, so and now you should see. Are you seeing the login details now? Yes. Yes, I am. Right. And then yeah. if I do this, oh, hang on a minute. If I do this, does that now show you Health Pathways? Yes, it does. Oh, great. Excellent. I know exactly what I'm doing now. All right. And then to stop showing screen, I just go stop showing screen. Did you stop the yes. webinar? Oh, thank God. No, I can't <laughs> stop it now. So oh, people God. can hear us and see it. Oh, but sorry, that's... everyone. <laughs> sorry, everyone. I started the <laughs> webinar early. <laughs> Oh, hi, John. Okay. <laughs> uh, hey, Sarah, how are you? I pressed the wrong button and I've already started the webinar, so be careful. What do you say? It's <laughs> a good show. Quick show is a good show. <laughs> how are you going? Yes, Catherine Turner, thank you. She's just sent me a message saying I can hear you in the webinar. I assume everyone can. Yes. Sorry, Catherine, I did press the wrong button. <laughs> I started early. That's fine. That's absolutely fine. It'll give everyone something to look at and listen to while we're just waiting another three minutes and then um, we'll start and John is here. Yeah. So, Hello, John. John, I'm just going to make you the presenter, John. Um, and how are you going, John Jones? Um, well, I'm uh, feeling well, so that's that's a positive. I don't feel sick at all. Sick mm -hmm. of staying at home, uh, but that's about as much so far. Uh, anyway. Oh dear. And how it's are you doing? It's amazing how. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm very well, thanks. It's just oh, a bit like uh, Groundhog Day, isn't it? It's a bit like Groundhog Day, and. Have you heard John Jones's story? <laughs> no, what's that? Do you want me to tell or do you want to tell Go on, John, it's your story to tell. <laughs> so I'm self-isolating um, after going to one of the halfway houses that uh, made the... Uh, I, I walked into a COVID storm. I'm not talking like a, a shower. This oh, was the a Maitland. COVID storm. Oh, the Maitland well, place. Well, active Kate. Oh, the May Mayfield place. No, Mayfield. Bull Street, yeah. Thank you very much. Oh dear, yes, um, <laughs> oh, mate. So, um, the, the oh, you did thing the that oh, down, down in the um, yeah, on the weekend there. Yeah, and, and no one was unwell. You know, yep. one, one of the one of the guys I refused to vaccinate because he was he was really sick, and I he said, you know, obviously I didn't vaccinate him. And they said, oh, no, he's coming down off buprenorphine. And I'm like, uh, no, he's not. This is not withdrawals. This guy is unwell. Um, and so anyway, I'm, uh, yeah. I had oh, like, good. PPE. I had face shield, N95 mask, and I also had a um, gown on. But um, they've said because of the, the sheer number of people in, you know, that I was in contact with who were um, positive, I, I have to isolate. So. As a close yeah. contact. Yeah, and so I was a bit dirty on it because I thought I'd taken the right steps to. Yes, well, that's public health. Public health do gild the lily with uh, that sort of process. But, Thank you, because um, they did. I said when they made the rules up on the on the run on the fly, really. Like well, I thought. Anyway, we've got 15 residents positive and one secondary case, and one staff member. Yeah. <laughs> but no, no new cases today. Well, that's good. All right. Well, we might get started. Um, welcome, everybody. And sorry about our little hiccup. We've started a little bit early and you've got to see what goes on behind the scenes, but that's all fine. Um, my name's Jenny Pearson. I'm the Professional Development Officer for the New England and I sit in Armadale. Uh, just before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on tonight and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. 
Um, we have uh, four presenters tonight, which will keep things very interesting and make it go very quickly, I'm sure. Um, our first presenter tonight is Dr. John Ferguson. He's the Director of Infection Prevention Services, a Senior Staff Specialist, Microbiology and Infectious Diseases at uh, for Hunter New England Health. So um, we might get started and um, you can take it away, John. Thanks very much, Jenny. So um, just a very quick presentation and then we'd very much welcome your thoughts and uh, comments and questions. Thanks. So a couple of slides from David Durheim, our Director of Public Health. So the first wave, of course, with the original Wuhan strain affected our elderly population overwhelmingly. That was because they were not vaccinated and it got into uh, some very significant aged care outbreaks. Contrast that to the Delta Wave 3, which is affecting a much younger population group. The elder, elderly population, much better vaccinated now, um, just changing the whole epidemiology. However, the transmission is still largely occurring indoors with household contact being the top level thing there, aged care and other venues workplace included. So very little transmission out, out of doors. And um, you know, most recently in Hunter New England, we've seen two aged care outbreaks that have been contained uh, without trouble because all the residents were vaccinated and also um, a managed care home uh, just in the last week. So you can see there the green represents household contacts and this is the x-axis going from the 18th of July up to uh, close to the end of August. But what about recent cases? So we're bubbling along largely below 20 cases per day in Hunter, New England and Central Coast is very similar, um, possibly lower. Um, those lumps have been caused by the aged care outbreaks on the left and the managed care outbreak on the right. In John Hunter at the moment, today we had 10 patients requiring inpatient care, uh, two of them in ICU, but those are Sydney patients who have been transferred up here. And already Gosford and John Hunter is receiving intensive care patients. The intensive care capacity is going to be vastly exceeded uh, by really in the next two to three weeks. And so there's a lot of dancing happening at the moment in, in healthcare. We've got 100 patients in under surveillance in the home. Um, contrast that to some locations in Sydney where they're dealing with 3,000 patients. Just imagine calling them every day. Uh, so 33 children, all of them well. Um, and uh, that's, children largely get off scot-free with this Delta strain, but there are, there's a significant minority who come to agree. So the Delta, highly contagious. You've heard the viral loads are much higher thousand fold higher and evidence of transmission during fleeting contact of unmasked people. Um, we do believe though that the surgical masks used in indoor environments are very effective at containing transmission. We think there's an airborne transmission risk, I'll talk about that. It possibly causes more severe disease, uh, certainly more disease in younger adults and children, um, but serious pa paediatric disease unusual. Uh, the the vaccines still significantly reduce the, the uh, chance of infection and um, the breakthrough infections are, in tra are transmissible. They have high viral load, but they, uh, the viral load only goes on for three to four days. So the transmission's truncated. Um, and the vaccines are still very effective at preventing severe disease. And you'll know that from the mortality data that's coming out of Sydney, the vast majority of deaths are in patients that have not been vaccinated. And the deaths uh, in vaccinated patients have been in patients, very elderly patients, usually with other comorbidities. And what about aerosol transmission? By aerosol, I mean finer particles, classically less than five microns, but really particles up to 50 to 100 micro microns can remain airborne uh, for uh, quite some time and travel further from the patient. Um, the finer part, those, those finer particles desiccate down to what are called droplet nuclei and then can remain suspended 
for a long period of time and can be inspired below the um, larynx into the lung where there are profuse uh, ACE2 receptors. So really with respiratory viruses, there's been this paradigm in the past about droplet transmission being responsible for most face-to-face -face transmission. And that's probably, probably still the case, but equally airborne aerosols can account for that transmission. And we know that the SARS-CoV-2 virus is actually in that fine particle fraction um, created by the patient um, to a large degree. So it's quite probable that close contact transmission unprotected is occurring through a combination of droplets and the finer aerosols. Now, of course, the, both of those can deposit on surfaces and fomites and, and you might possibly contact that and take it to your mucosal surfaces and infect yourself, but that appears to be a very uh, rare route of infection. It's mostly through um, this droplet or, or aerosol. So in May, the infection control expert group did change the device around COVID care to go to a P2 respirator standard for um, suspected or proven cases of COVID. So that's, that's in high risk settings uh, like hospitals. Now, I'm just trying to see my slide again. So what about aerosol production itself? Uh, I think there's been acknowledgement now that even breathing in some individuals creates large amounts of uh, virus and speaking, particularly using plosive consonants. And there's a very funny viral video of a professor from UK there telling you about ways in which you can stop using plosive uh, consonants. It's quite funny, a very um, straight faced. And um, coughing itself is, is highly uh, able to create large, large quantities of aerosol as is nebulization. The other aerosol generating procedures like CPAP, uh, non-invasive ventilation, intubation, CPR, probably don't create significantly more aerosol than just normal living people. So that paradigm of having one infection control standard for aerosol generating procedures has really gone out the door. We just have one standard fits all. In terms of infection prevention controls, we'll get onto specifics for, for you guys in a moment. But um, uh, in essence, there's a hierarchy of controls, uh, immunization at the top, engineering controls, administrative controls, and then PPE. What about engineering controls? Well, this is becoming important because of the recognition of aerosol and virus and the, the need to maximize fresh air ventilation if we can, um, the need to spell rooms, uh, you know, small rooms, particularly things like elevators where uh, these particles can linger and cause a subsequent infection risk to someone who's unprotected, looking at airflows within care zones and, and locations to look to see whether there's an escape of air out of a room to a, say a clerical station. And really we've tried to get negative pressure flow isolation put in place in our emergencies and hospitals. Um, but uh, the, the standard by which hospitals are built in New South Wales is a positive pressure single room standard. So single rooms are positive pressure to their corridors. So this sort of, we're trying to turn that on its uh, head, which is very difficult to engineer, reverse engineer into our current settings. We, there's, there's a vogue now to reduce airborne load at the source. So if you don't have a proper negative flow room, we put one of these uh, HEPA filtered mobile air filtration devices that are quite quiet and just sit in the corner. They're, they're very efficient at removing particles from the air, more efficient than, than a routine air conditioner. Administrative controls are probably the most important things. These are the sort of things you do at the front of your pharmacy to vet who is coming in and keep out the people that shouldn't be coming in. So training your meet and greet triaging staff and having a, a very good process there is, is key. And we've worked a lot on that in the healthcare setting, uh, managing and resourcing your staff, um, you know, educating them. Uh, really, that's that's incredibly important. Um, managing the workspaces, training the staff, 
environmental cleaning, checking that uh, the right precautions are in place. Um, so walking around every day to check, um, watching for acute respiratory infection in staff and really empowering them to speak up. Uh, it's, it's fantastic during this pandemic, the, the amount of uh, staff coming to work sick has diminished, not entirely. Uh, one of the, the outbreaks we had a week ago was relating to a pathology collector working in the Central Coast in two locations, two days whilst sick with COVID. Um, that wasn't very helpful. Eye protection. So there are consensus recommendations for use. There's not robust evidence showing that eye protection makes a difference, but there is a reasonable amount of um, evidence pointing in that direction. So the COVID task force has come up with a consensus recommendation. No evidence that sealed goggles provide better protection. So it probably is the droplets that are important to stop getting on the eye. And uh, there's a good eye practice point points document there from the, um, the uh, COVID task force, the evidence task force. Um, face shields, equally valuable to eye protection. So if you've got a, a face shield, that's, that's fine. Now, surgical masks source control have been really uh, revolutionary across the world. I think the recognition that wearing surgical masks in every location to put a, put a damper under transmission has, has been shown again and again to be a very effective measure. So just the masking of people to prevent them excreting infectious droplets or aerosols, they're very good at doing that. There's, there's hamster models that um, validate this. And um, a properly worn surgical mask also provides source um, protection of the wearer from viruses, possibly not as good as a P2 respirator. So, um, so that source control, incredibly important. So that's, that's what's happening when your clients come into the pharmacy unknown. They may be asymptomatically shedding uh, respiratory viruses and that surgical mask is dealing with that. We know with Delta that there is a, a significant pre-symptomatic um, excretion period of up to 48 hours. And those patients, uh, or, or indeed young patients that are asymptomatic, who excrete virus for three to four days. Other protective elements, of course, you'll know all of these, uh, and I won't focus on these. Um, and there's good guidance out from the CEC about these things. I think staff COVID vaccination really takes, damps down the anxiety around transmission incredibly. Um, certainly we've seen that in the healthcare setting, our staff in our COVID wards um, are really just getting about business, not really anxious or concerned. They, they've got confidence in the vaccination, confidence in their PPE use. So um, it's really not a sweat for them this year. Cleaning and disinfection. So the virus is viable on surfaces for a period, um, but at low quantity, we don't really know if this poses a risk I've mentioned. And um, I guess we don't like cloth furnishings in hospitals because we can't really clean them. Uh, except with steam, um, touch services and furnishings we need to think about because that, that's really the locations that are going to cause infection, not the floors. So cleaning and disinfecting touch services and furnishings. We tend to use single purpose commercial disposable disinfectant wipes for that purpose. Um, obviously the cleaner should be wearing gloves at least to during that cleaning process. Um, and we need to think through uh, possible fomites, reused equipment, etc., and the other processes are routine. Um, waste streams, um, COVID waste goes into normal waste. There's no, it's not contaminated waste unless it's flood, flood containing. And really, uh, laundry can be done in the usual manner. So this is the guidance sheet from CEC, which I'm sure you've seen, uh, counselling that um, surgical mask use, not respirators, and eye protection um, for all comers, basically, with patients and customers wearing masks on entry to the pharmacy. Um, so what about staff when they get exposed? So in, in community pharmacies, this will be subject to a population health risk assessment. 
So they will ring the case, they will ring and work out the close contacts of the case, the casual contacts of the case, the case, and assess whether the venue was at a significant location or not. Um, if so, the venue then gets attended to and you'll be interviewed. They'll look at your video if you have it available and so on. And so they will basically do their assessment of the individual concern based on exposure, duration, environment and closeness, um, whether there's source control, uh, whether they wore, the, the staff member wore the correct PPE. Um, and we follow a similar process in healthcare. There's a different risk matrix um, which is linked to there, but that's quite instructive, I find, uh, for even community settings. There is likely to be a nationally agreed risk matrix that will be used across community and healthcare settings, um, but uh, not possibly for a couple of weeks. So there are my references, which I'm sure you've seen. The, the ATAGI website is, is has a wealth of information. Um, the CEC guidance there, and there's also a guidance link from the pharmacy um, society on the bottom link there um, concerning vaccination clinics in community pharmacies. So I will stop there and hope I'm not over time. Is that uh, okay? No, not at all. Um, that's great. Um, I didn't mention um, there is a question box. Uh, so if you have any questions, just type them in. Um, and uh, Sandra's going to facilitate the questions tonight. Sandra is a clinical editor for Health Pathways with the Primary Health Network and a pharmacist. Uh, so please don't be shy. <laughs> if you have any questions, just type them in and we'll do our best to um, get to, to get to them all tonight. Um, our next presenter is Patrick Cashman. Uh, Patrick is an immunisation coordinator with the Public Health Unit for Hunter New England Health. Uh, so Patrick, I'm just going to make you um, the presenter. And you are on mute, and that's your presentation showing now. Perfect. Can you see that, Jenny? Yep. Yes, I can. G'day, everyone. I'm Patrick, or Patty, Patty Cashman, uh, from Hunter, New England, and nice to be able to talk to you tonight about vaccines. And good to see John had vaccines at the top of his hierarchy of, of measures. Uh, so just acknowledging we're meeting on Aboriginal land, and just interesting to remember there are over 700 languages in Australia. Uh, before 1788, so very diverse place. Um, so the virus, COVID, coronavirus, it, it, it's very tricky. So this is just a, a graphic from Nature, um, the virus's pathway um, and getting into the cells. So it meets the ACE2 receptor in your respiratory tract and it's the spike protein that opens that ACE2 receptor and allows that virus to get in. And this gray area here is what happens in our cells the virus bursts open like viruses do, the RNA comes out and then you get many, many replications. Then that pops out of our cell. Then our, this is where our immune system meets it. So the um, antigen presenting cells, these funny shaped cells, present the virus to the immune system. Then a whole heap of cellular things take place. But the main thing is that there's two sorts of cells. There's the B cells down here, and they make the antibodies. The antibodies are always depicted as the um, Y-shaped um, things in diagrams, and they do that because they're Y-shaped. And then the T cells. So what a really good vaccine gives you humoral immunity or B cell immunity and antibodies, as well as T cell immunity. And then the B cell immunity called forms long-term immunity memory. Now we can easily measure the antibodies, but we can't so easily measure the T cells and the memory cells, the memory B cells. So long-term immunity is really hard to judge, um, which is coming into play at the moment. So the antibodies are measurable. 
Um, so what the vaccine does is it tries to replicate this process. So the virus um, infects us and, and, of, and of course pops out and then it starts to stimulate the immune system. Um, but what we try to do with the vaccine is have a harmless uh, copy of that. And we typically use in um, COVID use the spike protein, but there's many, many other proteins on the virus, um, about 28 other proteins. But we try to copy that spike protein. So all the vaccines really are trying to copy that spike protein and then stimulate your immune system in that way. Um, so if you're interested in the um, the pathway to get to where we are with all the different vaccines. There's a seminal paper last year from Katie Flanagan, who's a infectious diseases physician in Launceston in Tasmania. And we're gonna talk mainly about the, um, the Moderna vaccine today because it looks like that's coming in. So that arrives in the country on Saturday. Uh, the TGA will do batch testing normally takes five days, but the government's pretty keen to get that out to pharmacies pretty quickly. My understanding is that there is 3,600 3, pharmacies approved in Australia for Moderna. They'll be allocated vaccines in three tranches of 1,200 each, uh, with about 300 and something coming to New South Wales in the first tranche. So that'll be sometime after Monday. I imagine there wouldn't be much hitting the shelves and the fridge is it by Monday, but after that. So that this vaccine will be, my understanding is just at retail pharmacies. Um, so I'll mainly be talking about the Moderna today, but of course you do have AstraZeneca at the moment. Um, so it's just interesting to compare how the two vaccines work. So this is of course a depiction of the um, COVID virus with the spike protein and the AstraZeneca uh, uses the DNA. So it takes a little bit of the DNA and puts that in an adenovirus. So an adenovirus is, a, it's a, a common virus. Uh, we all have adenoviruses every winter. It causes coughs and colds, or at least before we took on all John's <laughs> methods of using masks and, and, and sanitizing our hands, we don't see as much um, winter coughs and colds, adenovirus infections as we used to. Uh, but this uses a chimpanzee adenovirus. It uses a chimpanzee adenovirus because if it used a human adenovirus, our immune system would recognize it and disable it. So it uses an adenovirus we're not familiar with. Then that gets the DNA into the cell. So that's the delivery package. And then the DNA um, is deposited into the nucleus and makes mRNA and the mRNA comes out in the cyt cytoplasm and then um, the, it stimulates the ribosomes to make proteins, in this case, spike proteins. Uh, but this is important because the adenovirus um, gives the DNA in the vaccine a lot of stability. So it's quite a stable vaccine as compared to the mRNA vaccines, as we'll see. But that's really just a contrast to what we see now with the mRNA vaccine um, over here. So this is, this is what we really want to look at today. Now, what happens with mRNA normally? So the um, Moderna that you're going to get uh, in your pharmacy soon. So the, if you ever forget what it is, the company, the name of their product is in the name of the company. So the last three letters are RNA, the first letter is M. So this company only make mRNA products. That's what they do. So this is what happens uh, with normal RNA, uh, messenger RNA. This is how it works. So this is not about the vaccine. This is about your cell. So obviously we've got DNA. Uh, that we get um, from genetics. Um, and then what happens is the DNA is only in the nucleus, but the ribosomes over here that make proteins are only in the cytoplasm. So we've got to get the message from the nucleus to the ribosome. And that's done with messenger RNA. Again, the, the, the hints in the name. So the messenger RNA like takes a copy of the DNA and then takes that and then the messenger RNA comes out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm of the cell and then runs through sort of like a, a tape through the ribosome and that has the code uh, and that will make a specific protein. So all our body, all the proteins in our body, in our kidneys, in our hearts, everywhere um, are, are made this way and the, and the out, output is proteins. Um, so what happens with the vaccine is that it doesn't deal with the DNA at all. It doesn't go into the nucleus. It's just here at the at the RNA stage, it's like a recipe. So it's giving you the recipe. So it's just the messenger 
of how to make it. So instead of the a normal vaccine goes into the nucleus, like we saw with the um, AstraZeneca on the previous slide, and then uh, the DNA copies to the RNA. Well, this skips that whole um, process, and as it happens, it's very efficient. So if you like, this is a slide from the company. Um, so the DNA, if you, if you have a computer analogy, is like the storage, the mRNA is like the software, and the protein is the application. So that's sort of how it works. Um, uh, now this, this is, now we're looking at how the vaccine works. So the messenger RNA uh, is this little um, a colored bit here. Uh, and then that's put into a fatty globule. And when we look at what's in the vaccine, we'll be able to see those, those fats. Now the, the thing here is that's it. Like that's very, very delicate, which is why you've got to treat it really, really carefully. So when you're working with mRNA vaccines, they're very, very delicate. So we saw how robust the AstraZeneca vaccine was in the adenovirus. This is just the messenger RNA floating around. It's in a little fatty globule. Um, so it's incredibly delicate. So no shaking it. If you've got, um, if you're drawing it up and you've got um, bubbles, you've got to be really, really careful. So really, really gentle, no shaking it, no banging it on the bench. Um, this is a really delicate vaccine. Um, then the messenger RNA is deposited into the cell. And again, the fatty um, uh, capsule around the messenger RNA allows it to slip into the cell. And then it doesn't have to deal with the nucleus, doesn't have to deal with the DNA. It's got the recipe here and it runs through the ribosome like a ticker tape and that will produce the spike protein or the copy of the spike protein, which is then expressed on the outside of the cell, picked up by the um, uh, antigen presenting cell. And then you've got your immune response like we saw on that first slide. So it's this bit here that is unique um, uh, to the mRNA. So all the vaccines from here on are all the same. They're trying to make a copy of the spike protein. It's just the way they get there is so different. Uh, now what's been uh, sort of a, a, a good outcome of, of, of the pandemic has been so much investment. There's a lot of new vaccines around and a lot of new technology. Um, now what's in the... Um, what's in the Moderna vaccine. So the, the top line here is just the active, active ingredient, which is the mRNA. Then you've got four lipids that make that lipid capsule that the mRNA sits in to protect it a bit, but it's not very solid. So it's not great protection and allows it to slip into the cell. Then you've just got some acids, acid stabilizer, salts and sugar. So there's really not that much in it. And that means it's quite delicate and there's really not much in it to react to. So it's not a very reactogenic um, vaccine at all. Uh, now the Pfizer does have PEG in it and the AstraZeneca does have, um, uh, does have, oh I've forgotten, stuff that's in soft serve ice cream. Uh, it's really, really common. Polysorbate. polysorbate. Thank you, polysorbate AD. <laughs> Thank you very much no from worries. the audience. <laughs> ah, save an old man. Um, yeah, so they, they're the two things that can cause um, a reaction to the vaccine. So it does have some uh, ingredients in it, but, but not very much. Anyway, I'm not going to wax on lyrically about this to a bunch of chemists. <laughs> um, but they're very, very delicate. So this is a picture of my garage with um, all the deep freezers in it with the mRNA vaccines. Um, they do have to be kept well. So it's really up to you to keep them really well. So once they're delivered, really high quality storage is really, really important and handling these vaccines are really important. So all the people who nervously turn up to your front door at your pharmacy, um, they, 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 you know, they've made a decision to come to your pharmacy to get the vaccine. It's really important they get a high quality product that's stored properly and kept properly and prepared properly. Uh, so what's interesting about the, so get the right slide, is about mRNA, it is just a recipe. So this is to make a spike protein, but we can make other things. You can put in a recipe for something else. You can cook something else in your cell and tell the ribosome to make a different protein. So what if you're born missing a protein? The obvious example is haemophilia. So you could theoretically make an mRNA to tell the ribosome to make the missing protein from the cascade, the clotting cascade. And this is a paper from last year. It's only done in mice, but it's been able to be done. So the, this 
mRNA technology, which is new with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, is going to open up a whole sphere of medicine where we can make little recipes, put it in the cell, and then make missing proteins or therapeutic proteins, or in this case, vaccines. So it's not just about vaccines, mRNA technology. So it's really quite exciting. Now, we've got to make sure that vaccines are safe. So pharmacovigilance. So um, there's a mob called Ausvac Safety. So I started a program 10 years ago after the problem with uh, influenza vaccines in kids, giving them febrile convulsions. Um, Vax Tracker, and we feed data into Ausvac Safety and they feed data to the TGA and that's looked at every week. So this is active surveillance where we contact people after they've had a vaccine and ask them how they are. Now Ausvac Safety sent out over 6 million surveys to people around Australia and we've got over 3 million responses. So these are big numbers and we also have pretty good responses, over 44,000 from Aboriginal people uh, to get the sort of data. And it's telling us that most people have no um, adverse event, um, about nearly half, 45% of people report uh, common adverse events like fever, fatigue, sore arms, um, but only a very small percent, less than 1% of people um, uh, seek medical care. Uh, so on the weekends, I'm a lifesaver on the beach. Uh, so at the beach, we put up the flags and we say, if you swim here, it's safe. And pharmacovigilance is the same sort of thing. So we say, yeah, we're looking to see what happens. Yeah, there was the clinical trials with 30, 40,000 people, but they won't show up the very rare things when we give it to millions of people. So it's really important if you're going to give the vaccine that you're, you're part of the vaccine safety program. Um, so on the beach, if there's a rip between the flags, then we move the flags because the evidence is that it's dangerous there. And it's the same with vaccines. So Atagi said, let's give the Pfizer vaccines to people under 50. Oh no, more people are getting um, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine to people under 50. More people had blood clots, so they then made it under 60. Um, so the um, uh, so it's really important that we keep, keep an eye on the vaccine safety. Uh, so this is um, data from the Pfizer vaccine, over a million responses, uh, and 62 people, 62 percent of people reported no adverse event with the first dose, um, but only 43 percent with the second dose. So with Pfizer, the second dose knocked people around with common symptoms like fatigue and headache more. Whereas AstraZeneca, it was the reverse. More people reported an adverse event with the first dose than the second dose. Uh, so this is active surveillance, but there's also passive surveillance. So if someone has um, a, comes back to you, to your pharmacy and say, hey, you gave me that vaccine the other day and this or that's happened to me, um, some of those things that we need, we need to then report. Now they get reported to the, to the TGA. Uh, they get reported to the TGA. So one of the things with all pharmaceuticals, as you would know, everything you've got on your shelves is transparency and safety. So the TGA report, every week they put up a new report and they say, well, so far in Australia, we've given 17 million doses. We've had 52,000 adverse event reports. And, um, and, and so it's all transparent. So the message to the community is that if there's a problem with the vaccine, we'll find it and we'll tell you about it. There was a problem with the clotting, um, a rare clotting, TTS clotting with the AstraZeneca. Uh, and this is the data from this week from the TGA. There've been six deaths from the TTS. Um, and uh, in Australia, there's been 116 reports, 50 men and 66 women. So this is something that we, we found out about by doing good safety surveillance. And then we put it up on the TGA website so everyone knows about it. So people who are worried about things that aren't um, made public on the government websites are probably worried about something that 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 isn't real because if there's a real problem, we want people to know. And we suspect that once you get the Moderna vaccine, um, there'll be a high demand for it because of this problem with the clots. Now, of all the vaccines given in Australia, there's only been seven deaths. So the six reported here with TTS and another one from AstraZeneca with another um, ITP clotting disorder. So it's really important you report any problems that come back. So we've got the active surveillance in Ausvac safety. Um, so from the New South Wales Health website, there's a nice cascade about how to report. Uh, and it's really important we report anything uh, that results in a serious adverse event. We don't need to report common things like fever, sore arms and things like that. Um, but if there is a, um, someone comes back to you and they've got an unusual um, event that needs reporting, you can report it directly to the PHU using the form on the New South Wales Health website. Or if it's something you'd 
not sure needs reporting, but the person really wants to report it, the person can report it directly to the TGA so that they have satisfaction that it's been reported on. Um, now, anaphylaxis is something people worry about, um, but it's incredibly rare. Uh, there's a seminal paper in the Australian Medical Journal a few years ago, or quite a few years ago now, um, and, and it listed all the causes of anaphylaxis. Vaccines didn't even get a mention. Vaccines are a really rare cause of anaphylaxis, but you need to be looking out for it. That's why people have to wait around for 15 minutes, but you're only looking at about four per million. So when you give a million doses in your pharmacy, you can expect four of them to have had anaphylaxis. Uh, but it's really important that you're aware and know what to look for. So it's um, what happens in anaphylaxis is that you've got um, histamine and tumor necrosing factor and other cytokines in your cells. Your cells break open and then because what happens is the, the IgE for some reason thinks that it's under attack. So the IgE proliferates, the IgE will then break open cells and all these, um, uh, all these uh, uh, cytokines are released. And then because you get cellular breakdown, you get uh, in the skin, you get like a bleeding type thing. So you get a red rash. You also get histamine released into your gut. You've got uh, mast cells where the histamine comes out of in, uh, line your gut. Um, and so that's going to leak out into your gut. So someone who gets nauseous, we sort of normally dismiss nausea as a medical sign, but if someone's sitting there and they're getting quite nauseous after they've had the vaccine, that maybe they've got a gut full of histamine and they're cooking up anaphylaxis. Um, but the BP drops, so that's a really important sign. So if you can take someone's blood pressure, that's going to give you a really good um, hint because they've got reduced cardiac output. And of course, adrenaline that will then reverse those signs. So it's very, um, once if someone is developing an anaphylaxis cascade, it's really easy to reverse. But it's not like having a heart attack. You don't have to, as soon as someone has one of those signs that you're worried about, you don't have to get out the adrenaline and give it to them. Yep, because that's going to put them on a medical pathway that's quite difficult to manage. And there's other things that look like anaphylaxis. Um, so there's one of these presentations a few weeks ago, uh, the immunologist from John Hunter, Dr. Michael Boyle, um, presented on that. And if you want to know more about anaphylaxis, I, I thoroughly suggest that you go back and watch uh, his presentation. He showed this slide, a study from Boston of 190, 189 people with allergic symptoms uh, with an onset um, between one and four hours. Now anaphylaxis, remember, usually happens in the first 15 minutes. Uh, now they reported things that you might think looks like anaphylaxis with flushing, erythema, dizziness, throat tightness, wheezing and hives. Um, now 159 of them agreed to have it again and they were all okay. 20% um, reported the similar symptoms, but it was managed quite well just with oral antihistamine. And 19 really thought they had anaphylaxis and then didn't with the second dose. So you don't have to go charging in with adrenaline all the time. If you do give adrenaline, it's really important you call an ambulance, that person goes to um, the hospital because anaphylaxis can be biphasic. So you could give your adrenaline with a half-life of seven minutes, um, then they feel fine, you send them home, um, but if it's true anaphylaxis, it could be biphasic and then they're in all sorts of strife. So they do need to go to a hospital. Don't give adrenaline and send someone home, but think before you give adrenaline, you don't have to dive in straight away. It's not a heart attack. You've got minutes to make a clinical assessment. Um, don't withhold adrenaline if someone really needs it. Um, there's a wonderful fact sheet from uh, Victoria from the, um, uh, the Melbourne um, Vaccine Centre. Um, and, and, it, and it goes through, so something that looks a bit like anaphylaxis is an acute stress response where someone can get quite anxious after the vaccine and they can usually be talked down with um, good care. So you need to be able to, if someone's freaking out after they've had the vaccine, you need to have the time to be able to manage that. Um, and But it's quite different to anaphylaxis and I thoroughly recommend you have a look at have a look at this. And when you think about it, if someone um, is, is um, uh, faints afterwards, um, they get quite lightheaded and pale and faint, and that will happen nearly straight away, like within a minute or two of you putting the needle in the sharp spin. Whereas anaphylaxis, um, it's, it's um, a cascade, so it's going to take about 15 minutes. Um, someone will feel quite um, hot and anxious and they will be at you. So someone who just sort of faints in their seat, 
um, and you see them just collapse onto the floor is more likely to be fainting. Um, and that's gonna happen quite soon after the needle. Um, someone with anaphylaxis, he's hot, flush, they've got all this histamine happening and they're anxious, they're gonna be at you and say, listen, I don't feel well, can you check me out? Um, so the message is you don't have to rush with the adrenaline. Don't withhold it if someone needs it. It is obviously life-saving, but anaphylaxis is incredibly rare. Doesn't have to be front of mind um, in, in your clinic. Um, now, with the mRNA vaccines are associated very, very rarely with myocarditis and pericarditis, mainly in young men under 30. Um, need to be looking out for usually between two and um, two, two to two days to two weeks afterwards. So if a young person comes back to your pharmacy and they've had chest pains, palpitations, syncope, shortness of breath, they really need to go to hospital and get checked out with a 12 lead ECG. They need troponin taken and a chest X-ray. Um, now it's self-limiting, doesn't need treatment. Um, some of them can be treated with coltracine um, and non-steroidals. Um, it's not um, it's not life-threatening and it's not, um, it's not an ongoing condition, but it is something you need to know about uh, and to direct people to come back with this sort of presentation um, to the hospital and put in an adverse event report. Um, so just a little bit on variants. Um, so this is, this is something um, that, that I, I saw in a presentation from a, a wonderful professor from South Africa um, and a colleague of his. So this is the spike protein here. And this, I think this is a product of someone looking down their electron microscope too, too much. Uh, but he thought this spike protein looked very much like the sort of Adonis Greek statue here, the torso with the left shoulder, the neck, the right shoulder and the chest. So this on the right hand side here is an early variation of the spike protein, but it still looks very much the same. So it still looks like a, the torso um, and all the variations are like this. So the vaccines are still really good at recognizing all the variations so far. So even though the virus is varying a little bit, it's not varying so much the vaccines can't recognize it. Now, if there was a huge shift and the, and the vaccines were working very well, then we just change the recipe of that mRNA, use, use the new one and make a new batch. Um, so variants aren't too much of a problem at the moment, so you can use those vaccines quite comfortably. Uh, so this was the original UK, this is um, B1, you would know from Australia, and this was the original um, UK variant, B117. Um, now, as you know, Moderna has been approved just the week before last for adolescents. So I think you're gonna get a fair bit of demand um, when you get that in your fridges. Uh, and I'll finish up there, happy to take questions afterwards. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, uh, Patrick. We do have a few questions. If I, um... Would, would you like to do some questions now, Jenny, or did you want I to would, go to John? No, I would like to do some questions now, if that's like okay. Questions. Fantastic, all right. And do we have uh, John Ferguson still in the room? No. No, we don't. Um, Patty, do you mind taking some of the infection prevention and control um, questions? <laughs> John would do it so much better, but yeah, I'm happy to have a go. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we've just got the first one is around that um, the, the CEC PPE matrix that um, John showed um, PPE for community pharmacies. And we've just had a question about that, you know, why? Because I think a lot of the ones for general practice, they're recommending P2 masks if you're going to be in direct patient contact. But on the community pharmacy one, it's just the surgical mask. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, the, I think John so showed some good data uh, that the surgical mask is, is incredibly uh, good in the community situation. So where it's not a, um, a clinical situation where you're looking after patients who are positive COVID, um, in the community situation, uh, the surgical mask is very effective, especially if both the uh, person coming in to be vaccinated um, mm -hmm. and, and yourself. And it's really not that much different to serving someone at a counter when you think about it. Mm. And I actually was uh, watching a webinar on Monday night, uh, an RACGP webinar, and they were suggesting um, that when patients walk in wearing a cloth mask, 
um, rather than getting them to take off the cloth mask, to put a surgical mask over the top? Is that something you think pharmacists should be doing when people are coming in to get vaccinated into the pharmacy, wearing a cloth mask? Uh, I don't know, but it sounds like a really a really good piece of advice. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, so adding adding extra protection um, is sounds like a a really sensible idea. Yes, mm. I think that's a great idea, Sandra. Great. And just thinking about, I'm just looking through the questions and trying to summarise them a little bit, but just thinking about, again, that CEC um, matrix of PPE, um, they're saying that, you know, some sort of eye protection is required if you've got direct patient contact. But I'm just wondering if you've got a positive case in the pharmacy, um, un unknowingly, uh, like poor John did on Saturday, although he had six of them, <laughs> um, but if you've just got the one, um, and they're sitting in the pharmacy for their however long it takes to have the vaccine and then their 15 minutes of observation, should all pharmacy staff be wearing eye protection? Because that was kind of the sense I, I was getting that we should all be wearing it. Oh, I don't know the right answer, but I would have thought yes. I would have thought in that situation. Uh, so John pointed out in his talk that the eye protection doesn't add a lot. It really is mm -hmm. the, it, the mask is doing most of the work. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but the eye protection does add a bit from droplets, um, mm -hmm. and I would have thought, again, there's, there, you know, um, I, I would have thought yes, it's it's mm. a customer you don't know um, of who you need to be cautious of. Um, so um, I would have you so you don't know when to put your goggles on. Mm. <laughs> so yeah. I think wearing them all the time um, is the, is the right approach. That that mm. that seems sensible at the. Um, Belmont Immunisation Clinic run by Hunter New England, which is huge in the, in the old Bunnings down at Belmont. Um, all the staff there are wearing um, eye, eye, eye protection. So mm. I would have thought it's a reasonable standard for all the retail staff at a retail pharmacy. Yeah, because pharmacies are considerably smaller than the old Bunnings. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, and also just thinking from a business continuity point of view, if, if, if we did happen to have a public a, a, a positive case and public health come and had a look, I wonder if people not wearing eye protection might be more likely to be furloughed for two weeks than people who who are. Yeah, exactly. And, so, and I think John can probably talk to that better than I can. <laughs> yeah. And so following on from that, we've got a question, um, and I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but whether face shields or, eye, or safety glasses would be better. Um, yeah, so John was ambivalent, I think, that face shields mm. or safety glasses, they didn't need to be enclosed goggles. Perfect. Um, now, the CDC have a video showing a knot and fold technique for disposable surgical masks. Is this a recommended practice? I think if the CDC are recommending it, then it sounds like a sensible, a sensible practice, yep. Great. All right, another one. Hey, Patty, are you able to comment on boosters and when they might be required in Australia and ideally whether Moderna will be used? Thank you. <laughs> Very yeah, that's a great there. question. So um, if there's boosters, it's likely to be an mRNA vaccine because the AstraZeneca is in the adenovirus. And if we start, if we get many of them, we'll start to recognise it. Um, so it's unlikely to be used as a booster. Um, there's a paper in The Lancet just three days ago saying that, well, the evidence for boosters for everybody is not that clear. We probably don't have the evidence for population-wide boosters, maybe for people who are immunosuppressed who don't respond to the vaccine really well. Um, obviously, ethically, we'd want everyone on the planet to have one dose before people in rich countries get their third dose. Um, but but, but they're, they're, the evidence for boosters doesn't seem to be that clear. Um, so the Israelis have started it, um, but now there's the, the, um, uh, the, according to this paper in the Lancet a few days ago, it needs a lot more thought. Um, and possibly a better approach would be that if we're vaccinated and then we're moving around the community after we open up and we're bumping into COVID virus, that's gonna naturally boost our immune system without boosters and without getting sick. So the um, the jury for routine boosters um, is still very much out. Whereas a month or two ago, I thought it was in and we're all gonna have boosters, but I think it's, it's they're, they're thinking more about it now. Mm, great, and a fabulous question just come through from Luke Kelly. Thank you, Luke. Um, what about, can you comment on the four to 12 week 
gap after the first AstraZeneca dose because there's, uh, I think there's a little bit of confusion in pharmacy about whether we are actually considered to be in an outbreak area and should we be recommending four weeks, should we be recommending eight, should we be recommending 12 um, and how do we um, communicate that to patients around, you know, um, slight decrease in efficacy versus getting your second dose in. Oh yeah, just let me let the security guy know that everything's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate. Sorry, yep. Bro. Okay, thanks, mate. <laughs> Just being um, tortured by a bunch of pharmacists. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> no, no, it's lovely. Um, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I, I, I think in Sydney, definitely we're in an outbreak situation and the shorter interval. Now, that with AstraZeneca and Pfizer that we have good data for, the first vaccine gives you like 40, 45% protection. And the second one nearly doubles it, like over 80, 85%, 90% protection. So that second dose is really, really important. So the um, you really want to get that second dose in. So if you're in um, if you're in Newcastle where there's virus about, I would have thought four to six weeks would be a really good idea, and not wait three months. Um, mm. If you're in Tamworth where there's not so much virus about, um, possibly you could wait, but maybe there's next week there's virus about, so that's a bit tricky. So I think the question is, are we in an outbreak situation? And that's the right question. Um, so I think in Sydney, definitely yes. Newcastle, probably yes. Um, in the rural areas, maybe you could wait. The trade-off is the length of immunity. So maybe the vaccine doesn't last as long if you, um, if you jump in and have it at four weeks. Now, a month ago, I thought we're all gonna get boosters and I thought, well, that's a trade-off that doesn't really matter. Um, but now the, maybe, maybe boosters aren't gonna happen um, every year with influenza vaccine. Um, so it, it, it's if, you, if, if there's no virus around, it's worth waiting the longer period. If you're in Newcastle, I would have thought getting that second vaccine as soon as possible makes a huge difference in terms of keeping people out of hospital and keeping people out of ICU. Thanks, Patty. I'm assuming now that I'm seeing you, Jenny, that you want me to stop asking questions. <laughs> okay. Yes, we're, 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 um, the clock's ticking away there, so we're running out of time. So we might go to our next presenter. Um, mm -hmm. Our next presenter is John Jones. He's a, um, a pharmacist and owns his own pharmacy. So take it away, John. Real long John? presentation tonight because I am currently in um, lockdown or isolation uh, for being exposed to COVID. Um, and so, um hopefully i can give you some real world experience um so business as usual in a, in a COVID pharmacy and i think at the moment there is no such thing as as business as usual so the irony is um and you know for us this tidal wave of COVID uh changing our, our businesses and, and the way we practice is quite um you know substantial and so um you know i think at times you you feel like uh, possibly tapping out but um, hopefully I'll take you through some yeah really practical ways of, of managing uh, and getting through this so here we go. Um, my first slide I guess um, depicts how important the whole team is as part of this process. Um, you know in each pharmacy we have some wonderful pharmacy assistants, um, Webster, um, techs and other junior staff who allow us to deliver services um, and so you know in this last week where I've had to um, self-isolate um, my team um, particularly have been enormous in stepping up and, and ensuring that all of the systems and all of the services that we provide as, as a pharmacy is able to continue um, so you know I, I think um, you know mentioning names like um, yeah, Lauren Clay, who's my dispense second, some of the others have done a, a wonderful job. Um, so, I think you probably couldn't see my screen. Um, no, now, <laughs> sorry, John. Yeah, there you go, so I was just rambling. Um, so here, here we've got a picture of the Knights, um, a mad keen supporter, um, and uh, obviously they were knocked out on the weekend. But um, again, yeah, it shows that, that um, being able to deliver these services in the pharmacy is something that takes a team of people uh, to do and each person has a really important role to play. So 
we're going to go through systems and processes, uh, a risk management framework, and and you know considering what things you need to have in place. Uh, what happens if a, if you do have a positive case in the pharmacy and what steps you need to take and then I guess a, a small case study um, just to sort of um, you know put some practical um, knowledge to it. So firstly I think the most important thing about um, as a pharmacist is what if you weren't there? Um, what would happen and how would the pharmacy run? How would you continue uh, to deliver services and uh, dispense medication and really this work should and for most of us has happened uh, over years and months. So this uh, isn't something that would have happened overnight. This would be something that you'd be working towards over uh, a long period of time. Um, we are mandated at the moment in New South Wales to have a COVID plan. Um, so, you know, for me personally, uh, until you're actually in that type of situation, um, you really do need to have uh, some sort of framework to, to follow in terms of what you need to do. Um, so if you haven't already done that, my advice is to um, you know put something together. There are a few templates around that you can use um, to help with with that. So thinking about firstly what systems you have in your in your pharmacy and how can you access those if you're not around. So things like rostering, how do you manage that? Um, if you're using a piece of paper on the wall, that's going to be really hard to reference to uh, when you're not there. Um, your patient management and dispensing, what services or what programs do you use? Um, and fortunately with Guildcare and MedAdvisor, you can access those uh, remotely. Um, service delivery, so thinking about, um, you know, how are you gonna be able to implement that? Um, and particularly putting in staff who are able and trained to do those jobs. Um, you know, that's a really important thing about trying to fill those gaps. Um, having remote access, uh, I know for me personally, it's been an absolute lifesaver. Um, and without it, we wouldn't be able to manage. So um, that's something that I would encourage everyone to, to think about. What are your key pressure points? So what things in your pharmacy could you pull out and not do or remove and reallocate your resources and um, staffing to those areas? So you know, that you're able to continue to, to run. And how can you get replacement staff? Um, this is a big issue, and I think this is an issue that's sort of wider than just uh, a COVID shutdown. I think in pharmacy, we are having, particularly in community pharmacy, a, a problem with being able to uh, keep and attract um, staff. Um, they're being taken into other uh, positions. Um, so, um, you know, I think our, um, incredible pharmacy assistants and um, Webster techs, um, you know, highly skilled individuals uh, are often, you know, paid less than um, some uh, other workers, NDOS workers that take people out for coffee. And I think this is something that really needs to get looked at. And obviously it's not in the scope of this presentation, but um, it's, it's a really important consideration. So now thinking about your risk management um, and how you're um, planning for if, you know, um, trying to reduce that risk of, of COVID presenting to the pharmacy. And I know some pharmacies, uh, particularly larger pharmacies with bigger teams, uh, have been rostering A and B teams. So that way there's no crossover from one team to the next. Um, often a very, very difficult thing to do, particularly when you've got sick leave or staff who are off and then you have to get a replacement in, that particular individual can then cross over into another work team, um, which makes it you know, really hard uh, to, to manage that. Um, PPE requirements, so as we heard in the last presentations about how we can reduce the risk of transmission um, uh, between not only the patients, but you know, in between staff, as well, um, because we don't know who may or may not be uh, infected. Um, there's probably also um, a time to think about uh, rapid antigen testing and its role. I know there was a presentation last night that um, mentioned that as one option for us to help identify those patients before they're turning up to work. And the cost of those uh, is not um, out of this world. It's uh, you know ten or eleven dollars per per test, but again, that becomes um, a cost to the pharmacy and obviously we wear that, that's not uh, funded or 
there's no incentives around that, um, but I guess it's something that helps with that protection. And probably something that's not specific to COVID, but staff burnout. I think at the moment with the absolute demand that's been placed on us and also trying to keep up with changes in legislation, new um, vaccination programs, it's created a huge amount of uh, stress and pressure on all of our staff from the, from the bottom up. So there's a risk um, that, that those staff won't be there because they are simply burn out and, and not coping. Um, planning for your pharmacy so that you're reducing touch points. And I think, you know, this is something that we've all been um, moving towards so that we're looking at online orders where we're moving towards um, applications, phone apps where patients can order their prescriptions, e-scripts, so that that time um, where patients are at the pharmacy is being reduced. Moving towards deliveries, uh, documentation so that patients aren't signing the prescriptions, they're not having to touch pens, they're um, filling out, uh, and in our pharmacy, filling out their consent forms um, using iPads, they're not having to do that. And some of those jobs, many of them um, outside of the pharmacy, so they again, that time and the number of patients in there um, isn't as high. Looking at cleaning cycles, so um, ensuring that the pharmacy is cleaned at regular points and sanitised to help reduce uh, that risk. And I'll reference again, we've all seen it before, the PPE guidelines. Um, I Look, um, I know this is the um, evidence guide, but in my particular situation, uh, this was not helpful uh, for whatever reason. Eye protection that I had on and the N95 mask um, that I also had on and a gown um, didn't um, class as a risk reduction. So it's a really hard one for us as business owners and health professionals um, to manage when we're given this advice and then um, sometimes those uh, goalposts change or uh, obviously there's, there's different factors, but um, we really need some clarity and consistency around this, I think. Okay, so we're, we've done everything we can to try and uh, reduce the risk of uh, a COVID case, but what happens when uh, the proverbial hits the fan? Uh, and I know it's everyone's sort of uh, worst nightmare and um, what steps do you need to take um, if you were um, exposed to a, a COVID uh, patient in the pharmacy? Fortunately for me, I wasn't in the pharmacy, so it definitely helped with that sort of risk uh, reduction. But uh, nonetheless, there's certain uh, steps that we need. So you'll be notified from uh, the public health unit. That's what the PHU stands for. Uh, or your employee uh, will contact you to notify you that they have been classed as a close contact or a casual contact. Um, so in that instance, um, if that patient has been there, and the population health units asked you to close um, for cleaning, then you'll need to follow their advice firstly, uh, and then follow your, your normal closing procedure that you would do uh, for any other occasion. Um, make sure you've got signage, um, obviously, to tell people what's happening and put in place your phone redirection. Um, if you don't already have remote access to your computers, can I encourage you all to make sure that you do tomorrow. First thing you do when you go in is you install an app like TeamViewer or there's multiple other um, programs out there, but you will need to have that in order to be able to uh, help manage the next, next steps. Cleaning, and so this is an, another important area of, of what do we need to do? So obviously before you reopen, there has to be a thorough clean of the pharmacy. However, it doesn't have to be by an accredited cleaner. Um, I know that that's sort of maybe the impression that everyone had, but it doesn't have to be. Um, we are able to clean the, the pharmacy uh, without that, and you don't need to uh, fog the pharmacy, although they, they do look very impressive. Um, Detergent and water followed by a disinfecting agent, or there is some two-in-one agents that are available, um, such as there's a safety active. Um, the TGA does have a list of accredited COVID uh, cleaning agents. 
Um, so you can get onto the website and, and find those. Um, Safe Work Australia also has a cleaning guideline um, for the um, uh, cleaning of, of uh, a um, business. Um, the next thing is about you know engaging with your team and obviously the team uh, is not just the staff but also your other health professionals um, that you're involved with. Um, so firstly making sure that you've got a way to communicate with them uh, and again there's a number of different means and every pharmacy will have their own whether it's a WhatsApp group, uh, Facebook, um, some of the um, rostering apps allows for that uh, as well so that you can uh, provide that communication to all of your staff looking at your rosters um, and then if you have uh, staff who test positive and have to isolate so thinking about um, which one of those positions can be filled by another staff member um, how can some of those done jobs be done possibly remotely um, so just thinking about um, how you can uh, put put those things together communication really important that you keep everyone uh, in the loop during this particular time. So before you start um, going out, obviously you want to sit down and plan a communication strategy so that you've got, uh, I guess, some idea of timelines that you're going to have, um, how you're going to manage things like stage supply or other services that are provided in the pharmacy. Uh, because just saying that we're closed is not going to be helpful and in some cases it's just going to provide a lot more anxiety in your patients and other health professionals. So uh, making sure that you've uh, thought it through, um, you've got timelines and also actions that you can uh, put in place to help manage those different uh, services um, and other things that you provide. Um, in terms of once that message has been put together, uh, using social media, uh, notifying the prescribers, um, PBS notification, and this is an important one, if the pharmacy is going to be closed for more than a couple of days, obviously that will significantly impact on the supply of medications and so uh, the PBS need to be notified. Using bulk SMS messaging services uh, and email distribution lists is important. If you service either group homes or aged care facilities, it's also really important to speak with them about uh, what's happened and how you're going to manage it, manage it and uh, what things you've got in place. And obviously um, these things should have been part of your COVID action plan so that you can put that uh, into place if the time uh, requires it. So continuing supply and this is I guess the thing that creates the most angst for all of us is how do we continue to do that? Um, I guess Firstly is you know ensuring again that you've got remote access to your computers. That will allow you then to at least dial in, look at patient histories, dispensing histories. If the patients need uh, e-scripts, they can be sent um, via um, back to the patient or um, other things like, for example, stage supply. So using programs like Guild Care, um, you can save the stage supply schedule so that you've got some um, idea of where that patient should be in terms of their stage supply. Um, putting in place something so that scripts on file are given to patients to be dispensed at other pharmacies, uh, looking at your opioid replacement therapy and obviously the clinic, um, pharmacotherapy clinic are very, very helpful with this type of uh, problem and rearranging dosing for those. Uh, your DAA service, so you'll have Webster packs in the pharmacy there. Um, how is that going to be able to be managed and supplied? And I did speak to Webster Care um, earlier in the week about um, moving the um, database profiles to another pharmacy if possible. Um, if you're expecting to be closed for a significant period and that can happen. Um, so there are certainly some um, things that you can put in place to manage that. Hopefully it doesn't happen. And then I guess I'll just look at, you know, this is uh, more to do with a vaccination service because I wanted to try and put that in as, as well. Um, but how we go about that, how do we manage that again with the risk of COVID? Uh, and so the first step is obviously planning, thinking about your workflow, 
staff training, communication, uh, and I guess the last thing is trying to create a, a fun workplace. And I put that in particularly because at the moment uh, it hasn't been a lot of fun and it's been very stressful on everyone. So trying to take moments to um, see the lighter side of things and, and have a bit of fun uh, with the staff, I think, is a you know really important uh, part of this. So firstly, looking at your workflows, and when I was going through the process of uh, putting our um, vaccination program together, I wanted to um, think about the steps that a patient would go through in, in being vaccinated. And again, thinking about reducing risk. So how can we keep them out of the pharmacy as long as possible so that they're not spending as much time there potentially exposing the staff? Um, and I believe that as part of the risk assessment pro uh, process by the uh, uh, public health unit is that they look at that, how long was the patient uh, in contact and what risk that would um, provide. So looking at that uh, and then taking them through those different parts of the pharmacy, thinking about on that the patient will be sent. So if you've got you know, one patient every 10 minutes and those patients have to stay in the pharmacy for 15 minutes, how many uh, of those 15 minute waiting blocks can you physically keep in there. So that sort of turnover of vaccinations is a really important consideration, particularly when you're thinking about your own risk and the risk of, um, to, to, the, to the staff. So here is, I guess, in my case, using different IT um, strategies to help with training and communicating. So when I was going through the process of looking at how we would vaccinate, um, I was using some of our rostering uh, systems and messaging systems to, to show the staff which uh, part of that process they would be involved in and, and how to do it. Uh, so having a really good um, sort of training and uh, communication uh, platform, I think, is, is, is key to being able to make that work uh, effectively. And then lastly, it's about, you know, as I said, um, you know, trying to keep things light and, and uh, have a bit of fun at work. Obviously, we've had um, you know, a, an enormous two years um, and you know, we've had attacks on pharmacy staff and um, you know, close to burnout for a lot of people. So just, I guess, allowing your staff to share their stories, uh, creating a positive and um, you know, supportive environment is, is a really important thing to try and make that uh, work. So that is the end of my presentation and uh, I hope you um, enjoyed it. Thanks very much, John, for giving up your time. And I hope um, the rest of the, your time in lockdown goes quickly for you. Um, our next Thank presenter you. tonight um, is a GP, Dr Ellie Warren. Um, Ellie works at Yeren. Um, and um, I'll hand over to you now. Thanks, Jenny. Um, just having a look, can you tell me if you can see my slides? Yes, I can. You just need to start them. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, it's really nice to be invited along tonight. Um, my name is Dr Ellie Warren, and I'd like to start by acknowledging um, the traditional owners of the land from which we're calling in. I'm on Dark and Jung country on the central coast, um, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging leaders. Um, I'm going to be talking about our vaccine response in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, and um, we're actually pretty concerned about what's um, been going on in the last two, three months. Um, so we're really asking for your help as pharmacists now that we've got access to Moderna um, to jump on board and help us vaccinate as many Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people as we possibly can. Um, so we know that um, Aboriginal people are at higher risk of serious illness due to COVID. Um, and this uh, is multifactorial, but um, clearly because of the higher rates of chronic disease, complex um, comorbidities, um, high rates of smoking, 
blood pressure problems, um, heart and lung disease, kidney disease. So um, they're really a very vulnerable group when it comes to this virus. Um, and the community have done so well until only a couple of months ago um, to keep the virus out. And um, unfortunately, we've just seen it taken off, um, taking taking off in uh, Western New South Wales, and now here on the Central Coast and uh, around Newcastle. So things are looking a little bit, um, well, uh, for want of a better word, um, potentially catastrophic in the latest modelling that we've seen. Um, so I guess it's really important for you guys to just be aware that this is an issue, and we've got um, some catch up to play. Um, so just looking at the case counts, um, really the, the main problem has been out in Wilcannia and uh, Dubbo, Western New South Wales, until recently. Um, we've got some um, virus spreading through houses in the central coast um, now, and um, now that it's in those vulnerable crowded houses, it's going to be pretty hard to um, control. Um, similar things are happening around Newcastle now too um, and Hunter New England. So it's relevant to everybody. Um, and this Delta strain is so contagious that once it gets inside a crowded house, then it, pretty much everybody will be positive. Um, and we're finding that the contact tracing is difficult because some people are asymptomatic and the virus jumps to the next um, house or when someone goes to the shops before we've identified the the first case and then we're sort of finding virus um, steps once removed before we've actually located the, the first um, case or two. So um, I think vaccination is going to be our main way to control it in the in the Aboriginal community. So you can see that um, the distribution of positive cases is mainly in the younger people. There's been some outbreaks in schools and spreading around kids. So it's going to be really important to get vaccinating that 12 to 18 year old age group. Um, and pharmacists will be so essential um, to helping us out with that. Um, so you can see this is the, the problem. So here, um, is the vaccination gap. And um, I'll explain in the next slide why that is, but um, we're pretty concerned about those lower vaccination rates of fully vaccinated people. So this has changed drastically. Just in the last week, we've seen it jump 10%, which is amazing. Um, people are coming in now to get vaccinated, um, but still um, in almost all areas across New South Wales, um, Aboriginal people are about 20%, 15 to 20% um, rate uh, behind the rest of Australians in terms of being fully vaccinated. So um, yeah, Hunter, New England, um, vaccination rates as low as 24% fully vaccinated, which is pretty scary. Um, so part of the reason for this has been certainly some hesitancy um, in the community early on. Um, and that had to do with some mixed messaging and slow government messaging that was culturally friendly. So um, Aboriginal people really need that um, targeted messaging from their own community using own, their own artwork and words and, um, and ways um, to portray these important messages. And we really did very well um, imparting um, the information around social, social distancing and staying at home, um, hand sanitising, they've taken all of that on, on board very well. Um, in fact, some of our elders have been in lockdown themselves since March last year, terrified to come out of their house. Um, they've been very good at, at staying safe, but um, for some reason, the vaccine message has been really hard to get um, into community. Um, also, I guess they're a traditionally a much younger population and we know that the life expectancy is about 10 years less than other Australians. So only 9% of Aboriginal people are over 60 years old and would qualify for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, when we switch to being able to offer AstraZeneca to the younger population, Already that confusing messages, um, the, the messaging had just um, made it completely inaccessible. We've been pushing that through um, messaging from Aboriginal leaders and elders, um, speaking of the safety of the AstraZeneca vaccine compared to the risks of the virus. And for some reason, people just won't have it. <laughs> They're not gonna have AZ. So now that finally we've got access to Pfizer, 
Um, mm. We've all been going quite hard over the last six to eight weeks to try and play catch up with the, the vac vaccination rate. So people are definitely interested and keen to jump on board now. Um, and there's a, a perception that Pfizer and Moderna, the mRNA vaccines will be um, safe and acceptable in the Aboriginal population. Um, so there's certainly been some mistrust of government and that has a lot to do with the past um, policies, stolen generation, all that intergenerational trauma that compounds um, these issues of social disadvantage. Um, unfortunately, they've um, become quite disempowered and it's um, it's confronting when government is telling people that you must do this or you're gonna lose some of your freedoms. Um, that's been um, a, a tricky thing to um, get our heads around. Um, but also the, um, I guess, lack of awareness amongst health providers about how important it is to provide those culturally safe spaces for people to feel like they can enter into your door so it's really simple to just put up some aboriginal artwork or a poster um, to say look we acknowledge that um, you know we hear you we understand um, we're aware of of, um, of the importance of being a culturally safe space. Um, so we'll talk about that as well. Um, and of course, we know that um, poor education, poor access to healthcare, transport problems, um, fear and shame, and certainly some issues about workforce shortage um, across the state, particularly in the Aboriginal um, medical services um, just chronically short staffed and that has played um, a big role in being, being able to roll out the vaccine effectively. Um, so what are the solutions? I guess you guys are gonna be part of the solution. Um, and just those really simple things you can do in your pharmacies to, um, to welcome people in um, and making sure your staff are aware of things like particularly the closing the gap payment um, co-payment measure um, that those CTG scripts are available to to help Aboriginal people access the cheaper medicines and we should all be offering that in every pharmacy so unfortunately sometimes we do hear back as GPs that um, a particular community pharmacy won't grant the CTG um, scripts so, um, but uh, that really should be something that everybody's doing um, and the recent changes with PRODA and HPOS haven't altered um, any of the um, access um, benefits that people who have already signed up to the CTG program should be um, uh, accessing those cheaper medicines still. So if you're not quite across those um, specifics, it'd be really great to reach out to PHN. There's an um, Aboriginal health liaison officer that could come and just talk you through that stuff um, if you're not comfy about how to do it. Um, it's just important. Another thing that just makes it that little bit easier for Aboriginal people to um, comply with their medication requirements and afford them. Um, so thanks for your um, help on that one as well. Um, but those culturally appropriate resources, you can see um, that how beautiful that artwork is for the COVID vaccination um, program. Um, campaign, the awareness campaign, uh, that the um, the artwork on the Aboriginal specific um, posters is much more exciting than the the plain light blue on on the um, standard posters. So um, even if you're not sure that you've got many Aboriginal people in your community, it's a lovely poster to have up on your wall, and it may just um, help that person decide to come in and get the Moderna vaccine from you. Um, other things that work really well is having an Aboriginal health worker on site. So you could reach out to the PHN or your local AMS um, to see if you could borrow someone and even think about running a special clinic for Aboriginal people on a particular afternoon. They love celebrating together. They love doing that. And they're used to doing that in a COVID safe way. Um, and the TGA has recently relaxed some of the rules about incentivizing to get people into the door. So you could offer them um, you know, some biscuits or a t-shirt or um, um, a, a little prize for coming in to get their vaccine. That's per perfectly acceptable. Um, so they love to celebrate together. And if it's about being well and preventative healthcare like immunizations are, it's a really nice way to get to know your local community um, and start to champion some of these equality 
um, issues. So that would be really important. Um, and I guess also to be aware that um, every Aboriginal community is different. So across the state, and we just need to just tap into the local community, um, reach out to those leaders through the AMSs or the Land Council um, or the PHN if you're not quite sure where to start to just really understand what the local community needs from you. Um, so if you chat to them and find out what they what they want and how to do it, and then once you have they, their help, then um, then they'll actually get people into the door for you um, and it'll work really beautifully. Um, another um, simple way to do um, engage with the community is just to share the, the local um, Aboriginal medical services social media um, posts. So um, many of you will have your own Facebook page and your own Instagram page, page possibly. If you follow your local AMS or even just the AH and MRC or Nacho's um, uh, Facebook and Instagram pages, that's a really nice way to have these culturally friendly specific posts to say, look, um, you know, we're aware that sometimes it's a bit daunting for you guys to get your vaccines, but we're open to seeing more of community and, and want to help you out. So um, share those messages, like and comment on their posts and, um, and that shows community that you really mean business um, when it comes to their health. Um, and nothing beats that direct messaging from the community themselves. Um, yeah, so thanks everyone. Hopefully that catches up a little bit of time and, um, yeah, let's um, have some questions if you have any. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Ellie. That was really lovely. Um, a very beautiful presentation. Um, I'm going to show my screen just so that you can have the Health Pathways log in details. Uh, can you see them now, everyone? Yes, we can. Yeah, great. And I, I, I'm going to, I'm just going to leave them up. I'm not, we don't really have a lot of time to go through health pathways, but um, on the left of your screen is Hunter New England. On the right is Central Coast. Pretty much every resource everyone's put up tonight is on um, one of those, um, one of the health pathway pages, but we've got a whole suite of COVID vaccination um, pathways and we've got the COVID information page that has all the PPE and infection prevention and control. But I really want to get to some of these questions because there's some really interesting ones here. Um, and apologies uh, if we go a little bit over time. I'm sorry, sorry, um, Patty, but I think some of these are fairly important. And oh, it's just suddenly got very small on my screen. But um, one of the things um, a couple of people have been asking about is about how long. Um, so with the Moderna vaccine, the company is claiming a 19 hour viability after first using the vial. Um, however, Atagi is saying, oh, someone just posted a question and it went yeah. off my screen. But Atagi, I think, is saying six hours. Can you Patrick, uh, comment on that, Patty, like the, um, what, what to do with the Moderna? Oh, yeah, I think we have to follow the Atagi advice. Sandra. Okay, yeah. and that's six hours, is it? Sorry, I've lost yeah. the question. Okay, fantastic. And hopefully pharmacists that answers your questions there. Um, and given the fact that one Pfizer or AstraZeneca vaccine confers minimal immunity for the Delta variant, is there any benefit to delaying second dose Pfizer shots? I don't quite understand this question. I, yeah. Is it better to have 200 people with first dose with a six week interval or 100 people with two doses and a three week interval? Yeah, it's a great question. So we've we've mm. we've we've done variations of them all. So in Sydney mm. at the moment, um, a few weekends ago, they had a big uh, push through the big hubs in Western Sydney, and they decided to delay Pfizer rather than using the conventional three weeks to use two months for exactly that reason, so they could get more people with dose one rather than half the people with dose two. Um, so programmatically, that has been done um, at your pharmacy. Uh, it really depends on what's happening around you and how much virus there is. I would have thought using the shorter interval to get people in for their second dose is, is probably the best the best advice at the moment to get as many people double vaccinated. Um, I think from it, yeah, so programmatically that's sort of from the health department to decide what they're doing from that. But from your point of view, the advice you would give to individual people coming in 
would be to come back at the minim minimal or just over the minimal interval. Mm -hmm. And another question around the Moderna, um, if the patient has, and I suppose this will be quite important for pharmacists because we will have both AstraZeneca and Moderna, if the patient has no contraindications or precautions to either AstraZeneca or Moderna for a 70 year old, do they have a choice? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Mm. That's a very good question. That's been one of my burning questions. I was assuming yeah. that if over 60, they, they weren't, wouldn't be allowed to get the Moderna, but I'd love to hear what the advice is. Yeah, that's right. So at the moment, the um, advice is if someone's under 60, we give them an mRNA vaccine. So we'd give them the spike vaccine, the Moderna vaccine. If they're over 60, we'd offer them the AstraZeneca. I think going forward that that advice will change as the supplies of um, Moderna and Pfizer increase, um, the uh, appetite for asking people over 60 to only have um, AstraZeneca will change. Now, the it, 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 like all medical decisions, it's a risk benefit profile. So the risk of clotting from the AstraZeneca is at its peak in the 40 year old age group and decreases dramatically over 60 to less than two per 100,000. Um, but the risk of the disease dramatically goes up over 60. So the risk benefit profile for people over 60, AstraZeneca is clearly a good idea. For people in their 40s, not so much. Um, as the supply changes, um, possibly that, that, that advice will change. But at the moment today, I think you'd be asking the 70 year old to have a AstraZeneca vaccine, um, mm. but that might change going forward. Excellent. And this is a question to either the PHN or to New South Wales Health. So, so Patty, I don't know if you can represent New South Wales Health on this, and I don't think there's anyone that can represent the PHN on this question. But um, one of the pharmacists has written that, that, that they've actually got another, They like John, they've got a pharmacist who was um, with a COVID positive patient, so he's out for two weeks and he's getting very nervous about it. Um, and they're asking, can we use your property somewhere to run vaccination clinics because they're getting very nervous to allow people into the pharmacy for 20 minutes if it risks shutting down the core business. And and the question is, you know, what can they put in place to stop um, that happening? And I suppose that will all depend on the sort of PPE that's being used, would it, Patrick? Is that... Sorry, that's a yeah, whole lot so of questions I... for you there, Patty. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, this, is, this, this goes across a whole heap of disciplines of, of, mm. of which I don't represent fully. Um, but I think it goes to John's excellent point that um, raises the, the, he's followed the advice of wearing the correct PPE. Um, but when he uh, was exposed to a positive patient, he was still asked by the public health unit to stay at home for two weeks. And I think that's a conundrum. Um, I don't have an answer. Um, I, I think that's a, a really good point, John, and probably should I should catch up with you afterwards about that and clarify that um, for, for pharmacists out there. I think that's huge. Um, yes. Uh, but yeah, so at the moment, um, yeah, there's lots of properties being used for um, COVID vaccination clinics. So we don't have spare ones for pharmacists just to, to, to use. Um, I don't know whether, uh, yeah, I, so I, I really can't, couldn't address that question, Sandra. Mm. Um, yes. we, 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 we've been really excited about pharmacists coming on board because they're sort of everywhere and where people are. And I'm really mm. hoping it's going to improve the vaccination rates. I think this is very exciting. Mm. And perhaps we need to have a conversation with the PHU about, you know, what what is it that, that pharmacists can do to really ensure business continuity with their PPE and, and their practices um, so that if a, if a positive patient does happen to walk in that they're covered. Because I know Ellie, um, I've been on the GP community of practice chat and hearing all those um, stories about GPs um, finding themselves vaccinating or being in the room with COVID positive patients and, and some of them have managed to continue with business as usual. So I think that needs some clarification and certainly we can liaise with the PHU about that. And Ellie, there's a lovely comment for you. Ellie's tips about making the pharmacy welcoming for the community are beautiful and hope they make it easier to get the community in to engage. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and someone else has asked, um, they've missed the first 30 minutes, but would love to look at the video if available. Yes, it will be available on the PHN Education Library, um, probably from tomorrow, I would say. Um, just having a quick squeeze through, I realise we are out of time and I don't want to hold up any of these beautiful people um, any longer because I think you've all been amazing. Um, I think I think we've covered uh, the, the main... The main questions. Um, someone missed the beginning of the talk. Um, 
Patty. So you're saying you can contact COVID through the eyes. I missed the first part of that talk with John. Can you please clarify? <laughs> Oh, John was John John was saying not so much. Uh, it really is respiratory um, droplets and um, uh, aerosol. Um, he was talking, but when he was talking about the eyewear, um, a shield and the goggles are equivalent. Uh, it's about stop, stopping the droplets. Um, it adds a little bit, but not nearly as much as the mask. So yes, um, you don't have to be. I think the message was some eyewear, but you don't have to be too fussy about it. Uh, getting COVID through the eyes is not as um you know it's not going to happen as much as breathing yep. it in yep beautiful and possibly the last question maybe where did it go would you recommend ibuprofen as um a preventative for myocarditis and just before you answer that either patty or ellie um we on health pathways we've got a range of COVID vaccination pathways um we've certainly got one for the tts adverse effect and hopefully very soon we are working on a pericarditis and myocarditis post COVID vaccine pathway so hoping to have that up um fairly soon and patty did sorry i'm just going off on a bit of a tangent here patty did talk about um adverse events following immunization um, reporting and um, we worked very closely with Patty and the team at the PHU to really carefully articulate how you can do that so please do go and find that on Health Pathways and follow the steps. But back to the question, can you do you recommend ibuprofen as a preventative for myocarditis? No, so the myocarditis is incredibly rare so you'd be treating an awful lot of people with ibuprofen unnecessarily so it's not a good practice. Uh, the signs and symptoms are clear, it's self-limiting, um, it does need investigation. People do need to go to hospital, but it's not terribly serious in that sense. Um, so, so no, we just find and treat the people who need it. Uh, don't just spread it liberally around just in case. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You are all such terrific people. Thank you for giving up your evening to support the, the pharmacy cause for, for vaccinating. John, we wish you all the best in your two weeks mm. of isolation. Yeah. Um, hope you stay sane. <laughs> um, and oh, there's been... Yeah. Beg your pardon? Eight, eight days to go and I'm eight not counting. And there's many, many um, questions coming in that are just saying thank you all so much. Great presentation. So thank you all so much. We are so blessed to have such great clinicians in our footprint who are so willing to give up their time and who are so wise and so intelligent and such great presenters. Sorry, Jenny, I'm probably doing your job here. Did you, did you want to no. take over? I would just like to say thank you to you, Sandra, for facilitating the questions tonight. And um, yes, to all our wonderful presenters. It's been a very engaging talk. Uh, don't forget the recording will be on our website and you'll get a confirmation um, email tomorrow. It will have the link to the site, um, our education library. So it should be up by tomorrow afternoon. Uh, thanks everybody and um, have a nice evening and stay safe. Bye-bye, thanks so much. See you guys.